This is Friday, May 6, 2016. We are at the Edith North Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital in Bedford, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in partnership with Native Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today Michael Ham. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born August 3rd, 1958. And where were you born? St. Paul, Minnesota. And where do you currently live? The hospice unit of Bedford VA. Your marital, <coughs> excuse me, your marital status? I'm single. Do you have children? Yes, I do. I have two of them. And grandchildren? Three. Tell us what St. Paul was like growing up. It was a hard working middle class city, which is also the capital of Minnesota. And do you have siblings? I have two brothers and two sisters. And did you go to school in St. Paul? Yes, I went all the way to, I graduated in 1976. It took me 20 years, but then I finished my education. For what kind of mechanics? Truck mechanic. Oh, okay. What did you do between uh, 1976 when you graduated from high school and when you joined the Army a few years later? I struggled with my alcohol and drug addiction for a couple of years. Then I married a woman and she convinced me to join the Army. And I thought it was a good idea, so I joined the Army. And when did you join the Army? September 1982. And where? St. Paul, Minnesota. Did family or friends uh, join the service when you did? No, they didn't. I was the only one. And aside from the wife's suggestion, why did you join the Army? I to serve my country and to see the world. That was a good opportunity to expand my horizon. Learn things and do things. And Where were you sent for basic training? Fort Bliss, Texas. Was this the first time you were away from home? For that amount of time, yes. Tell us what that was like. Oh, it was like night and day. Left the lush green grass and shade trees of Minnesota to the high desert plains of El Paso, Texas. I was in, it was a big shock, but that's part of why I wanted to join the Army. And was this the first time you met people from other parts of the country? For the most part, yes. And tell us what uh, basic training was like. Uh, something I'll never experience again in my whole life. It taught me teamwork. It taught me to go past my, what my body was telling me and my mind took over. But once I finished, I don't think I would ever be the same again. I felt like I could accomplish anything if given the task. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about being in the Army in the early 80s. This was post-Vietnam and still kind of Cold War. A lot of training, a lot of practice, practice, practice. They wanted to get the books out of the experience in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. A lot of my senior NCOs and officers were Vietnam vets. And it was a lot of hard work. But my old time in the military, all the practicing, I never saw a day of combat, but in the first Gulf War, everything that I had practiced, they did with precision, so I was like impressed with, and actually, it worked with whatever they were trying to do. Did you receive advanced or specialized training during or after BASIC? Yeah, for, for air defense artillery, radar. 
Did you choose that branch or did the Army choose it for you? I was kind of chose it for myself, but I was colorblind. So I was limited to what I wanted, could do. And I looked at all my options and that seemed like the least harmful, if that makes any sense. And how long were you in basic? From September 1992 to December of 1992. 92? 82. Thank you. Uh, that'd be a long time for basic training. Yeah, that would have been a long bit of basic training. <clears throat> Ten years. Mm. Where were you sent after basic? Fort Stewart, Georgia. The 24th Infantry Division mechanized. And what were your duties? At first, it was a lot of CQ, charge of quarters duty. I worked for the first sergeant because I had back problems. And I finally, then I worked for a lieutenant who was part of communication security. And then I was able to work in my MOS, which was ground for air defense radar. Can you describe that uh, particular radar in some detail, or is that still classified information? Oh, they don't even use it anymore. Uh -huh. It's uh, we're forward of the battle line and we detected incoming aircraft. And where would you be? Forward of the battle area. Did you have any special equipment with you? Yeah, a van with a radar. And all its working parts. And you were a radar operator. Were you also taught how to maintain the radar? Yes, we did. We called it BMCS, preventive maintenance. And I forgot the rest of it. That's it's okay. It's been a long time. Uh, were the, was the radar reliable? I think so. And what was the range on the radar? Like five miles. And could it could it detect just anything? Uh, helicopters and and aircraft airplanes. I mean, given the radar equipment that is available now, you got. It almost looks like a video game with all the colors and the 3D. Oh, that was that was after my time. Oh, I know that. What 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 did it look like on your screen? Um, we had symbols. Mm -hmm. We had to identify friend or foe. And I don't remember exactly what the symbols were. But we had uh, IFF codes that we didn't interrogate. But it happened real quick. How long were you stationed in Georgia? A year. And were you out on maneuvers all the time? Yeah, we were part of the rapid deployment force. Who were you trying to rapid, rapidly deploy against? Uh, to the Middle East. That was their primary mission for the 24th Infantry Division. And what was going on in the Middle East at that time? Peacekeeping duties. Nothing out of the ordinary like today. I mean, the Middle East has been the Middle East. <laughs> well, I remember that bombing in Lebanon, I believe it was in 1983. Yeah, I was in the Army when that happened. Uh -huh. uh, and I, yeah, I believe some Army personnel were killed. The Marines, they the lost Marines. like 240 people. 
Do you remember what you were doing when word came out about that? Yeah, I was in the hospital. I had back surgery. I spent a lot of my time in the Army dealing with my back. What happened after Georgia? I came down on life to go to West Germany. You're going to West Germany? Yes, ma'am. And this is your uh, first time overseas? Oh, yeah. And only time. And only time. What was that like? It was awesome. And what part of West Germany were you stationed? I started out in Hansbach. And where is that? Near Nuremberg. In Bavaria. Not the worst place to be stationed. Oh, no. Then I... They decommissioned that unit. And I was sent to Spengdalem Air Base in Spengdalem, Germany. Are you still a radar oh. operator? Oh, yes. And what was your uh, rank at the time? E4, E5. Like a sergeant? Yeah. Okay. I was a, back then it was spec 5. Mm -hmm. Then they did away with that rank. Mm -hmm. And I got my heart stripes. Talk a little bit about, uh, say, the uniforms you were wearing at the time. Uh, were you wearing drab, camo? They called it a BDU, the battle dress uniform. We called ourselves a salad because it was camouflaged in dark green, black, gray, light green. Now why we wore them and we were, I was at Fort Stewart training to go to the desert. Army, that's infinite wisdom. But it fit well in Germany. Okay. And what about, uh, while you were um, being a radar operator, were you required to wear any weapons or bring them? No. Okay. And while you were being a radar operator, were you wearing any special headgear? Uh, just for communication, we had Mickey Mouse ears to talk to other people within the, within the van. Okay. While you are out in the field, uh, tell us a little bit about life on the field. What did you eat? Did you have regular meals? Let's see, we'd get our grid coordinates and we'd set up. Confirmed that we were set up. And MREs were starting to come out. We, were, we had sea rats and MREs because I was in the Army of Transition. <laughs> they were bringing a lot of new equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the new helmet, you couldn't do a lot of things with, you couldn't do with the old helmet. Same way with the MREs. Remember, this is like 1983-84. They still haven't worked all the bugs out yet. I found that I remember it was harder to cook them and to eat them. And we did get odd meals. We'd have them brought out to us. Or we'd, we'd go into the battalion area and they'd have a kitchen set up, a field kitchen. So we'd get odd food. And um, on a typical field mission, how long would that take? Will you be out there for a week, 10 days? Oh, it didn't. It varied. Mm -hmm. I think the shortest amount of time I was gone, like two weeks. Mm -hmm. But we moved around a lot. We were rapid deployment. They wanted to see how quickly we could set up, tear down, and move to another location. And what was your personal best? What did you do for sleep? Oh, we rotated. We figured it out. That's what I think about the American military. Mm -hmm. We always figured it out. 
And did you sleep in bags, bunks? I usually slept on top of the radar van, which was where I'm supposed to. Or underneath the vehicle. Or sometimes a hammock. Uh, sometimes in the front seat of the vehicle. Just depended. Um, how about medical care? Uh, it was the best. I, th I had no complaints. Well, while you were out on the field, say you had a little boo-boo on your finger. I never had any issues. Okay. And none, of, and none of the people that I was around had any issues, but they would practice gas drills because they were all about chemical, biological, and nuclear warfare. And we'd, we'd have to be uh, casualties sometimes. So the medics and the doctors could practice what they would do in the event of war. And what did you do about um, sanitation? Oh, we were all about sanitation. It was part of learning how to fight a war. How to stay uh, personal hygiene. Everybody else is taken care of too. Michael, are there any special experiences from Germany that you remember? Yeah, working with the German army, our sister units, it was always enjoyable to get somebody's other country's view on how they're doing in the military. Did you develop any friendships while you were in service? Yes, I did, but that's, those days are gone. And how long were you stationed in Germany? Three years. Which gets us to about 1985, 86? 87. 87. So that's only two years before the Berlin Wall fell. Yeah, I left before that happened. Mm -hmm. But I was in Germany when Reagan. President Reagan, the 40th anniversary of D-Day, and I was in Sherman, stationed in Bitburg, or near Bitburg, when he went to the Nazi cemetery and didn't know it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Those two things I remember more than anything else. I mean, it was a lot, I mean, I loved my experience of living in another country. What happened after uh, Germany? Went to Fort Riley, Kansas. And what did you do there? I spent most of my time on medical profile because of my back. Mm -hmm. So I worked for the Sergeant Major at Battalion Headquarters. And my primary job was to escort soldiers that were getting out of the army. Mm -hmm. How long were you stationed at Fort Riley? One year. Then I got out of the army. Mm -hmm. And you were discharged? Yes, honorably. Honorable discharge. What was your rank when you left? E5, sergeant. Still E5. And where were you um, discharged? Out of Kansas? Yeah, Fort Riley. Okay. Uh, tell us what happened after you left the Army. Okay, I met this young lady named Laura while I was stationed at Fort Riley. And within a year, we had our first child, a son named Adam. Mm -hmm. Then after that, he was born. Laura finished school in Massachusetts. Then I went to Minnesota. We had our daughter, Lindsay, and that's when I finished school for truck mechanics. Then we moved back to Massachusetts to raise our family. Where did you live in Massachusetts? Cluster. 
What part of Colaster? I'm just curious. West Colaster. That's where my, my former wife is from. In fact, her mom still owns the house. Still. Where she grew up in. Okay. So you uh, became a truck mechanic? Yes. And you worked up at the North Shore? Actually, I worked for a used car dealer in Middleton, Mass. Middleton? Yeah, Middleton. Oh, Middleton. Yeah. I was thinking, Middleton, boy, that must have been a commute. Yeah, it was. From closer to Middleton, it was a commute. Mm -hmm. And how long were you a truck mechanic, or at least worked for the used car dealership? So I worked with him for probably about eight or nine years. Michael, um, after you uh, left the service, did you join any uh, veterans organizations? No, I didn't. <laughs> did you take advantage of the GI Bill to go to school? Yeah, I, had, I was enrolled in what they called VEP at the time. Mm -hmm. There was a contribution of money every month. Mm -hmm. And I used that when I got out of the, the Army to go to truck mechanic school. Okay. Michael, how important has it been for you to serve in the military? Oh, it gives me a lot of pride mm -hmm. to know that I've done something that I know a lot of other people haven't. And it gives me a, a warm feeling inside to know that I accomplished something that was beyond any dream I ever had, mm -hmm. physically and emotionally. I grew, I grew up a lot. And Did either of your kids uh, join the military or thought about it? No, they, they're millennials. They don't want to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> what do you think about the current military situation? I mean, you were, you, back in the 80s, you were trained to fight for, the Russians. And the Russians, and probably get deployed to the Middle East. Well, the first Gulf War, mm -hmm. the 24th Infantry Division did go to the Middle East. And the commanding general, when I was at Fort Stewart, was Norman Schwarzkopf, who was the four star general, Desert Storm. So that part was right after I got out of the military. But what's going on now, I think it's nonsensical to fight in two countries for as long as we've had. And we're still going back and fighting because the same people are doing it over and over and over. And it's kind of sad to see these young people doing all this work where I feel it's not the wrong cause, but there's a lot of people in the United States that are ungrateful. That would be a hard thing for me to do if I came back home from doing this deployments over and over and over again. And I'm starting to meet a lot of the younger vets now here in Bedford and to listen to them talk about their experience. I just enjoy it. I've always enjoyed listening to combat veterans talk about their experience. Because I just sit and listen in awe how these people survived it all. And they're able to talk about it. Now, Michael, we just uh, mentioned, you just mentioned the Bedford VA. Do you, would you like to say a few words about it? So far, it's, I've only been here a couple months. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty impressed with everything. I don't have any complaints about the VA care they give me. Michael, is there anything else you would like to say about your experiences in the Army? That's something I'll never forget. But at the same time, it gives me a lot of pride and joy to serve my country. And I have a lot of breaking power around a lot of people that I know who haven't joined the Army or the military. Okay. 
Well, Michael Hamm, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. You're welcome. Thank you.